Hello friends, you're on the Insecurity Project with Jamin. Today I have the great pleasure of interviewing Daniel Tolson. Daniel, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, nice to be here with you and your audience also. Great. Um, insecurity is a very important subject and one that I'm, I'm convinced the more conversations that I had about it, the better. And, and not just the more conversations, because we don't want to just add to the noise, but conversations that are intelligent, that are meaningful, that are, that are real and, and useful. So I'm really fascinated to hear your own journey and some of the tools, insights, observations that you use in your work with people in the real world today. So why don't we begin at the beginning and hear a bit of your backstory and, and in particular uh, your experience of growing up and particularly the, the impact your parents had on shaping your own sense of self. Tell us a bit about that. When I was about six or seven, I started, uh, I was in school and I started to realize that I just couldn't keep up with the other kids. So the teachers were always writing home reports that uh, Daniel gets distracted, he doesn't pay attention, he could do so much better if he applied himself. And they started to rate my report cards with uh, D's, E's and F's. And I thought the D uh, was for Daniel, the E was for excellence, <laughs> the F was for fabulous. <laughs> but I think it was denial, he's, he's an exception and he's a failure. And I kept hearing that, but I had this sense inside that I was actually intelligent, but I thought the teachers were a little bit stupid because they kept asking me the same questions. And I kept giving them the answers that were right for me, but mm -hmm. it definitely didn't fit the mold of, of school. So by the time I was in second and third class, I was constantly out of the class and they were asking my mum to explain uh, my results. And it went on that I had a, a series of learning difficulties. And uh, you were telling me before that, before you were on the radio last week, uh, you reversed into a car. Mm. <laughs> so one of my strengths back then, my spatial awareness was very good. good. And I thought laterally, but I didn't think lineal. So they'd ask me questions and I would come up with an out-of-the-box answer. And they thought this was a bit strange. So they looked a little bit deeper. I, um, I had a tw twisted spine. Uh, my neck wasn't aligned. And my cranium, the platelets were pushing down on the brain. So I had a learning disability called linear sequential learning disability. And essentially, you couldn't learn sequentially. So the way that my mind worked naturally because of those disabilities was in a very lateral way but that didn't suit the system. Hmm. So they put me in remedial therapy uh, for a good couple of years. They massaged my cranium back to a normal shape. Uh, they realigned my spine and I stopped running around like Forrest Gump. So for me, I didn't know any different at that stage. And it probably wasn't until I got a little bit older that I realized that I'd been doing things differently. So as I got into high school, I was just kicked out of class consistently. I was kicked out for using colored pencils and colored pens because I went to a grammar school and you don't do that at grammar school. So I had a lot of challenges at the start. I didn't realize that I was different Then I realized I was different and I just wanted to be like everybody else, but I didn't fit the mold. Didn't matter what I did. I wasn't like the others. Wow. So those early years, uh, there was a lot of conditioning there from school and a lot of things that had to be undone afterwards. Mm. So to, to answer the question, what was it like growing up? It was very challenging. Um, but my father, he was a very good role model. He didn't teach me anything verbally because he's a man of a very few words. I remember in 2000, I was traveling through Europe. I'd ring up at home and I'd say, G'day, dad, how are you doing? And he'd say, great, let me put you on to your mother. <laughs> That's about as much as he'd say. So there was really no advice verbally but non-verbally is a, is a role model of excellence. Mm. And what I learned from my dad was he has never compared himself to other people. He never compares his possessions, his achievements, his money to anybody else. He never talks negatively about anybody else. He doesn't engage in gossip with other people. Uh, he doesn't share his goals or desires with other people. He just gets busy achieving what he wants. So he's a man of few words, but he's taught me a lot just through his actions. And he's a farmer and he gets up in the morning, he goes to work, he works till the sun goes down or to when the job's done and he comes home. And he just doesn't worry about what's happening with anybody else. But he did tell me one thing, Jamie, and he said that uh, as a farmer, 
if you have one good year in seven, that's really good. And if you have two good years in seven, you'll set yourself up for life. Wow. So what that tells me is that you're going to fail more times than you succeed. But that one failure, that one success will make up for the, all the other failures. But if you just get it right twice in the seven years, then you'll be set up for life. And that's exactly how he lives his life. And that when, when that was modeled to you and explained to you, obviously that was something that you took on board and went deep inside you. Absolutely. Uh, when I was a competitive athlete, uh, you'd just say, job well done. Didn't matter if I came first or last, it was always job well done. Wow. And it was never, what did somebody else get? What did they do? How come yeah, they sure. won? How come you didn't win? It was just like, hey, good job. You did your best. Amazing. So, all right. So there were some interesting physical challenges growing up, then some great modeling from your dad. Um, so were you, were you aware of times when this feeling of not being like others or not being as good as others actually limited you? Or, or did you feel like you were able to reconcile that and, and move forward quickly? Did you get stuck anywhere along the way? I think there was a time where I just wanted to be like everybody else. Mm. And that would have been happening in high school. And I remember I had been working hard and I saved up enough money to buy a Datsun 1600. And it was my first car and it cost me two and a half grand and um, mum and dad went dollar for dollar in the purchase. So I spent two and a half thousand and they invested two and a half thousand into the car. So I had a $5,000 Datsun in 1997, which was a lot of money back then. Mm -hmm. And once I started to drive that car to school, I realized that those people who I wanted to be like were not the people that I actually liked. I didn't like who they were mm -hmm. because as soon as I had something they didn't like me anymore. So I had a beautiful car. It was worth $5,000. They were driving $30,000 cars, but mine got attention and theirs didn't. <laughs> and I remember clearly going to a, a high school party. Um, I wasn't drinking. So I drove and I came outside and they'd poured beer all over my car. And I thought to myself, they're the people that I wanted to be like. Mm. And then I realized in that moment, I just want to be me. I don't mm. want to be like anybody else. So that was probably one experience. And then the second experience would have been when I was in the sport of wakeboarding. And I'd been water skiing since the age of four. My dad was a champion barefooter. Uh, he always took us out on the water. Uh, we were training. My brother was an Australian champion athlete. I was Australian champion, three times state champion. Wow. Uh, I competed in the X Games, which is the highest level in the sport. And one of my biggest insecurities at that time was a fear of getting hurt. And I was always thinking in my mind that I was going to injure myself. So throughout my career, and even all the way up to age 26, when I became the Australian champion, I knew that I was performing far below my potential. And it used to piss me off hmm. because I knew that my body could handle it. I knew that I was stronger, if not stronger than everybody else. I knew I was more resilient, yet I could never access my full potential. And so those doubts started to creep into my mind. And my brother probably started pointing it out to me at, I reckon, at the age of about 14 or 15. And he'd say, Dan, he'd say, you can do that trick, but you've just been a pussy. He's like, you can do it. You've got the style. Yeah. You've got the right equipment. You can do it, but you're just freaking yourself out. You're overthinking it. Just go out and do the trick. Yeah. And he'd say that to me and I'd go out and I'd never complete the trick fully. I'd let go too early. And I'd hurt myself. So I ended up convincing myself that I'd get hurt. Yeah, right. So he'd point it out. And these doubts would creep in. But then I would do things outside of that mold. So we also used to create movies. And we had a company that created best-selling movies across the country. And the interesting thing was every time the camera was on and the film was rolling, I'd perform at my best. I'd do the biggest tricks that I possibly could. I'd never do it in training, but I did it when the camera was on. Yeah. If somebody told me to do a trick, I'd land at first attempt when the camera was on. And he said to me, you will perform when the camera's on, but you'll never do it in training. And if you can't do it in training, you'll never succeed. Mm. I'd go to a competition. I'd write all these tricks down that I wanted to do. Even if I had never attempted them, I'd land them first trick, first time. And he'd say, see, you can do it, but you just don't apply yourself in the practice because you're freaking yourself out. You want success, but you don't want the failure. 
you want the glory, but you don't want to go through the pain. And so that become a big insecurity and a goal that should have taken me three years to become Australian champion. It took me 10 years, but even when I achieved it, I think I probably achieved it at about 40% of my potential. So that was a big problem. How did you fix it? What did, what did you do? Well, eventually I stopped riding mm. because at 27, a year after I'd become Australian champion, I moved to Dubai and I was the uh, one of the first Australian expatriates there to bring the sport to the Middle East. Mm. And I would go out, I'd turn the camera on and I'd do the biggest and best tricks. And eventually I just convinced myself that I was going to get hurt. So even when I retired from competition and went out and rode socially, I thought I'd get hurt. But as soon as there was a demonstration or a competition or a camera, I'd get it right. So it was in 2008 when I really, really got angry. And I believe anger is a great motivator in life because you get to a stage and, and you're just pissed off. You're just like, why am I not achieving these results? Why do I do this to myself? So mm-hmm. it took me 28 years to get really angry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I went and started to study psychology, behavioral psychology, hypnosis, uh, CBT, all of these things. And I hired a coach and I wanted to overcome that challenge. And I realized it was nothing wrong with my body. Mm-hmm. It was just what was in my head. And so I spent a good, you know, up till today, uh, it's been a journey of more than 10 years, uh, 12 years, just to understand why I think and feel the way that I do. And I realized that it was the pictures that I was playing in my mind before I even attempted the trick. There I was crashing and burning inside of my mind. And so it was a problem of how I was visualizing it. I wasn't visualizing myself executing the tricks correctly. I was visualizing executing, hurting myself perfectly, (laughs) hurting my knee, hurting my ankle, Mm. getting injured. And once I learned to change the images in my mind, I started to lose that feeling of insecurity, that fear of failure, that fear of the unknown, that fear of hurt disappeared. And at, I believe at 32 and 33 years of age, I was actually a better wakeboarder than I was in my teen years. Because once I removed the mental blocks, my body went out and I started to do these tricks and I tested it. I removed all the mental and emotional blockages. I hadn't trained professionally for years and years. Within 30 days, I was doing bigger, harder tricks than I had been when I'd been training full time. That's it was all in the mind. The body was older. It wasn't conditioned, but I'd conditioned the mind finally. Well, so um, I can't let you go on there. That's, that's so profound um, to really highlight, you know, what is, that, what is that key lesson there that's, that can be applied not just in wakeboarding, but what did you take away from that moment of discovery about what, what just happened to you there? For me, it was that feeling of unfulfilled potential. Mm. And I knew within myself that I could do so much more, but I was getting rewarded for poor performance. I was still rewarded as the Australian champion and I was only fulfilling 40% of my potential. Mm. So what was happening is I was getting the win without really trying super hard. Mm. And then I realized that if I was to progress any further in life, whether it be with sports or business, I really had to work on my mental attitude. Hmm. And that was the biggest key component. Yeah, it was all I in mean, the mind. I'm sure so many people would have that same experience. They just, they know that they're capable of more than they're achieving and it, it upsets them and creates anger. But like you, I, I think anger is a really important uh, motivator. In fact, you know, one of my, the key parts of my model is, is around stacking the pain and as a coach, one of the things I'm really looking for in a client is anger. When they're really, when there's enough pain, it shows up as, as anger. And it's a pure emotion and such a strong driver to go, I'm done here. I'm literally done. I cannot keep showing up like this. Whatever it takes, um, this, yeah. is not where, this is not going to be the result I replicate in my future. And from off the back of that motivator, then they, they're willing to explore a whole bunch of uh, new possibilities and and pretty, probably review where they're wrong i think where they've made a mistake in their thinking so mm. so cool to kind of watch that happen in real time for you as you've got kind of made the shifts and then gone out and been out of road test it on the water straight away mm. well I, i'd look at myself up on the podium and say i don't deserve this yeah right. i have got the australian title and i'm i'm mucking around i'm not even unlocking my potential i've mm. done this on 40 percent 
And I never compared myself to other people. The competition was never against the competitors. It was always about myself, but I knew I was getting rewarded for poor performance. Mm. And that was something that I had to correct. And it was a behavior that I'd also seen in business. Um, I was in real estate at age 19 and I'd become uh, one of the top 10 sales creators in the country three times in six months. And I was doing the same thing in business at that stage. I was winning without really putting in a lot of effort. Mm. So the behavior on the water uh, also transferred to business. Mm. And I had to make sure I'd corrected that uh, to have a successful business, but also to be able to help other people through those same challenges. Were there similar limiting mindsets that showed up in business? So, you know, you mentioned that at a logical level, you knew and your brother knew and those around you knew you were capable of doing those tricks but the story and the visualization was that you couldn't and you kept seeing yourself fail. And so that became a a self-fulfilling prophecy. Was that showing up in the business space as well, where you knew you were capable of more than you were achieving and you noticed some key visualizations or mindset stuff there as well? It it almost appears as laziness. Yeah, right. Because what would happen was I'd get the results so easy. Right. And I was like, man, that was just too easy. Mm. And, and that created a problem because the results came so easy that even if I had to push myself, I was like, why would I push myself if I can be lazy and get these excellent results? Like, what's the point? Mm. So I had to be very mindful of that. And with teaching people how to win sales, the most important part is prospecting and it's filling the top of that funnel. And because when I was learning to prospect, I didn't fear rejection. And I had a very good mentor and he said, look, if you just do what other successful people do in this field, you'll get the same results. So to my credit, on the top end, when it came to prospecting, I was a prospecting machine. I'd knock on 500 doors, ring on 500 phones a week, and I'd do the numbers. But so it was within my comfort zone. So I did it easily. And so because the top of the funnel was full, everything trickled down and it was so easy. Yeah, right. That was the problem. It was just happening too easy. Why didn't I go to, why didn't I speak to a thousand people? Mm. Because 500 was too easy and I got paid big money. Mm. It's a pattern and you've got to get out of it. Yeah, sure. So, so keep, keep telling us how this, how this story unfolded and uh, what that led to in your business and how you kind of corrected that mindset and yeah, what it's led to for you. So through my personal challenges at school, I developed a lot of resiliency and I had this level of respect that I would almost call disrespect. I would respect people, but I definitely would disrespect their opinions about me because I was told so many times that um, I didn't try hard enough, that I was a failure, Mm -hmm. that I wasn't going to succeed. So I would look at these people and I'd be like, you just don't know what I'm capable of. Mm -hmm. I don't fit in the box and you're trying to measure me within the box and I don't fit in the box. So I'm going to go and do my own thing. So at age 19, I was like, you know, bugger these teachers, I'll show them what I'm made of. And I went and become one of the top sales agents in the country. Hmm. But the interesting thing was they weren't even watching. So that was a failing formula. I'm going to go out and prove to you how good I am. And they're not even watching. So you feel a little bit deflated. And so I realized that the best thing to do is just to accept that people have a difference of opinion but don't respect the opinion. The problem is once you respect the opinion, you can take it on as gospel. So I just say, look, great person entitled to their own opinion. I just don't agree with their opinion. So in business, when I started, I set my goals. And the first year in business, everything failed. So my first year, I had about $80,000 in the bank account and I wasted all the $80,000 on trying new things. But I wasn't disappointed per se. I was like, well, I've got to try a lot of things. And going back to that input from my father, yeah. you know, you're going to have one good year in seven and it'll make up for it. So I lost my $80,000 by the end of uh, 2013, 2014. I was down at Centrelink on Newstart because I'd run out of capital. Yeah. But in business, there's a principle called leverage. And you can build a very successful business by leveraging other people's money. Right. So I've been paying my taxes for years. I went down to Centrelink. Um, there was a lot of shame in it and it was a very humbling experience, but I got new start allowance and it just let me get back into the game. And then for a hundred days, I just went hard at it and I went and knocked on doors, rang on bells. And in a hundred grand, a hundred days, I had a hundred grand of business. <laughs> so I was flying pretty high. Mm. And then I realized that the market had changed coming into the middle of 2014. 
Um, the inquiry stopped. People weren't buying coaching services at that stage. And by September, uh, I was selling my surfboard, I was selling my couch, I was selling my TV, and I was moving my family from Sydney back to Taiwan. Yeah. And when I got back to Taiwan, there was no money. Uh, we lived on the third floor of my wife's grandmother's house. Wow. But I wasn't depleted because I knew I just had to find another way. Mm. So I started to write books about uh, business. And at the same time as coaching my loyal clients, I was moonlighting. And I was out teaching uh, seven and eight-year-olds English. So I became an English teacher. And it was just enough money to keep me in the game. Mm. And then I started to teach adults at night and gave me a little bit more money to invest back in the business. I'd coach and consult during the days. I'd teach English at night and I was in the game. So it was just this resiliency and this willingness to try something new. And mm. I'd also learned that from sport. I had to keep trying things differently. I'd overcome those mental blocks and I realized it was a mental game. So the fear wasn't there and the shame wasn't there and the remorse and the guilt wasn't there or the hurt. And I just kept trying new things. And as I started to write my books, I started to make more money. I started to get more clients. And then after that stopped working, <laughs> I went back to zero and I had to reinvent the business model. And it was always coming back to that thing, you know, just have one good year in seven and everything will be okay. So 2016 comes around and everything just clicked. And in 2016, I acquired 500 clients globally. Mm. And it all started to work the following year. Uh, there was 1,000 clients the following year after that, 1,500. And now about 4,500 clients. And just one good year can make the difference. So preparing to fail was a big part of my mindset, knowing that most things wouldn't work. But if I just got one thing, the ROI on it would be massive. See, wow. Um, I, again, I'll end the press pause there. I don't think I've asked particularly good questions of you yet, but I'm so glad for what you're sharing because it's, uh, in spite of my poor questions, it's high, high quality story. Um, but one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about as you're sharing that is, you know, all, all we have is story. We're storytellers. We go into the world and we tell stories. And off the quality of those stories, we get to experience results in, in life. And so, so often people's storytelling is, is really low quality. They tell stories that diminish them. Like they might say, if I fail once, then I need to give up. That might be the, the, pre the prevailing narrative. Or mm -hmm. that might be what they pick up from the world. But you've, you've picked up this story, which is just a story. Like your dad's told you a story. Is it true or not true? I, I don't know. It's, it's a story. Um, and it worked for him. And you went, that's mm -hmm. a great story. And off the back of that story, that story is going to give me permission to go into the world and try stuff. It's going to give me permission to go into the world and fail at a whole bunch of stuff. In fact, it's going to give me permission to fail like predominantly more times than I succeed and I'm still going to feel good about myself. <laughs> what, an well, what an incredible story. Like, even if that's the only thing people take away from this conversation, that just to review the qualities of the stories they're telling about themselves and pick a better story. Pick a story that serves you and gives you space to go live. Mm. My my mum, she would tell me, Daniel, I, I, I see you walking with the giants. I mm. see you walking with the CEOs and the, and the power players in the world. And she'd tell me that story from a young age. So I have this, it's like a, a, a movie role in my mind that there I am in my suit, mm. uh, my expensive shoes, my nice handbag, yeah. walking along with the giants of the world. And so it's been programmed into me. And because it's in the reticular activation system, I know that it's going to come true because I'm always looking for a way to achieve that vision that's in there. And we call that heterogenic conditioning. The family's, my mum's conditioned me to look for that. And it just sits in the mind and it's activated and I'm always looking for a way. So when it comes to dealing can with I setbacks. Just, can I just explore that for a moment? Because while that has been incredibly positive for you, I've got lots of people who would push back and say that's the reason they're not succeeding. They would say their parents have heterogenically uh, programmed them for failure or for a small life or that they can't achieve. So um, I love Don Miguel Ruiz's distinction. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the four agreements. Have you come across I, that? I listened to it about 20 times last year. Um, <laughs> Every what, what, I'm reading, I'm reading the fifth agreement at the moment, which is just recapping on that and adding some more, some more stuff. But yep. his distinction is game changing because he says, hey, listen, it's not the words said to us or about us that shape our destiny. It's the ones we agree with. Mm. So The matote. The matote. 
The Matote, okay. The Matote. Incredible. But just so, so your parents had some storytelling for you and you liked those stories and went, they are true stories. They are my stories. I, I agree with those stories. And that's how those stories became powerful prophecies for your life. Whereas, mm. whereas people agree with negative stories. Their, their mum or their dad said, you, you know, you'll walk with ants or you'll never succeed or you're hopeless. And they went, I agree. That's the story. That is a true story. And so that becomes heterogenically planned into their life and therefore that's all they experience. So I, I love just positioning people with power in their own storytelling rather mm. than going, it's not my, it's all fate. My parents did this for me because they were good parents. They set me up. Well, no, they didn't actually have that power. They did some cool stuff, but you had buy-in. You exercised your own personal power by agreeing with that story. That's where the power came from. So I think that's such a, a really important distinction to hold on to where you're aware of, of limiting stories you, that your parents may have um, tried to instill. With, with the heterogenic conditioning based on my research into the field is there's three things that must accompany um, heterogenic conditioning. Okay. And, and the first one is that your parent, the, the parent must love themselves. So my father is very high level of self-worth and self-esteem. Yep. And so does my mother. Mm. So when they say you can achieve this, I believe them mm. because it's coming from a place of empowerment. You know, there's, yeah. a, there's a saying that you can't give what you don't have. They so embody it. Yeah. They embody it. They, they love themselves. Mm. The second thing is they love each other. Mm. So when they say it to me um, in combination or individually, I know it's coming from a place where there's no guilt, there's no doubt, there's no shame. It's just from unconditional love. And they look at you as unlimited potential. Mm. And then the third thing that must happen is the parent must have to love the child. And we know in hypnosis, and I've been studying hypnosis for more than a decade, is that in hypnosis, if the hypnotherapist does not believe the patient can make the change, the patient won't make the change. Hmm. So those three conditions are definitely met by my parents. They love themselves, they love each other, and they love me unconditionally. Where a lot of parents, unfortunately, don't love the child. And this is where we get the pushback. So the parents, and I've seen this before, is they get together, the relationship's not good, and they say, you know what, let's have a child. That'll fix our problems. Mm -hmm. And when the child is born and doesn't fix the problem, it becomes the source of their pain. Mm -hmm. So the child knows it unconsciously, and um, you, know, you can measure an emotion something like 128,000 kilometers away from the body. It's been proven. You can measure it out of space. The parents say, you can achieve anything that you want, and the child says, you don't believe it. Mm -hmm. And that's when they push back, and they'll say, I'm going to prove you wrong. So those three conditions have to be present for it to work. Mm, yeah, wow. That's so fascinating. Um, okay, what, what else? What else from the, from the stuff you've learned in your own experience and from what you get to share with others, uh, what else can you teach us around this idea of being someone who doesn't get held back by insecurity and who's able to, to go and live their best life? What, what can you share with us? Definitely work on your emotional intelligence. Okay. Based on my research and research that's been done in Forbes magazine uh, is emotional intelligence contributes to about 58% of your success in life. Right. And emotional intelligence, there's five critical factors and five pillars of emotional intelligence. The first pillar of emotional intelligence is self-awareness. And this is understanding who you are why you think and feel the way that you do. Mm. It's about understanding your likes and your dislikes. It's about what works for you and what doesn't work for you. It's about your drivers and motivators. Are you driven by acquiring knowledge or you, are you driven by using your own intuition? Do you seek power or do you like to collaborate? You know, there's so many driving forces. Uh, Self-awareness is also understanding your attitudes. And this is how we approach things in life. It's understanding our beliefs and most importantly, our limiting beliefs. And I believe my biggest insecurities have come in my life because of my limiting beliefs, mm. not believing something's possible for me, yeah. doubting myself, comparing myself to others. So we're going to spend a lot of time building up this level of self-awareness. And with self-awareness, uh, we have a bit of a misconception in society today where people say, just focus on your strengths. 
and everything will take care of itself. Mm. Well, I just call bullshit on that mm. because if you have a motor vehicle and it's got four wheels <laughs> and one of those wheels are flat, it doesn't matter how good a driver you are, that car won't perform it at its best. It won't matter how good your visualizations, your affirmations are, you've still got a flat tire. It doesn't matter if you ignore it, the tire is still flat. So we have to look for those blind spots and it's the blind spots where we come undone. It's not what we know that hurts us, it's what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And through self-awareness, we start to realize that there's things that limit us. And then we can start to put plans and strategies together to correct those. So the first pillar of emotional intelligence is incredibly important. And it's just getting to know who we are, know thyself. Mm -hmm. The second part is self-regulation. And self-regulation is your ability to control those disruptive thought impulses and those feelings. So people talk about negative emotions, but emotions come and go really quickly. It's the mood that we get stuck in that really impacts us. And people have been in moods for a week, a month, a year, and even a lifetime. And they can't get out of it because they can't regulate that emotion correctly. They can't regulate the feelings that follow. And then the third part is our level of motivation. And I believe the biggest impactor right now on the planet is the comfort zone. And I hinted at this earlier on. I got rewarded for poor performance. I became the Australian champion because I was operating at 40% of my capacity. So what you say to yourself is, why would I extend myself when I can get rewarded for being lazy? But it was that same attitude that kept me stuck. Instead of getting to the success zone, I was in the comfort zone. And that's our level of motivation. And Australians got to say to our country, men and women, that we have become lazy. We have got too much too easy. We have one of the best countries to live in the world. We have one of the best healthcare systems and we can get it all for doing the absolute minimum. And that's what stops us from tapping into our excellence. Mm -hmm. So there are three major areas that I'd be focusing on uh, if I was coming through the ranks again and it's still what I do today. Yeah, wow. Well, uh, that's very useful. I'm sure people, that, that's given people a, a way into this space. If they haven't considered that before, that's really cool. Um, are there books that you recommend regularly for people who are looking to build their emotional intelligence or uh, yeah, really deal with their limiting beliefs? I don't have a favorite author. Uh, I don't have a favorite book. And it's simply because I just read too much. What I recommend is hire a coach. Go and get a coach because uh, over the years, I've probably read more than a thousand books. I've read 30 this year already. And what happens is books give you a lot of good ideas, but they're so general in nature that you'll read it, but you won't be able to apply it to yourself. Um, what you can achieve in a year with a coach would take you maybe 10 or 20 years of trying to fix it yourself. So I'd just say, just go hire a coach. But if I was going to read something, uh, and I've been asked this before, just have a look at what your problem is or what challenge you'd like to overcome and read everything that you can find. Because in my field of business model innovation, what we know, if you want to improve a business model, you might have to make four or five changes to your business model to get one result. But that might take you four or five years and you don't have that time. So what I do with the companies I work with is I make massive amounts of changes and it's called multiple variations. So if you read a lot of books, if you get a lot of ideas, if you listen to all the podcasts, especially this one, if you download every book and just put it all in your head, what will happen is you'll start to join up these dots in your head really, really fast. And I'd say 90% of the stuff that you try won't work, but it'll be that one thing and you're not going to know which one it is at the start, but one thing will click and you'll achieve more in one year than most people will in a lifetime. Incredible. I've never heard anyone explain I never had anyone answer the question, what book should I read like that? That's a very clever answer. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> the great treat about doing these podcast interviews is I get more out of it than, than most listeners, I think. Um, what a joy. Uh, okay, have we missed anything? Is there anything, any final thoughts uh, that you think would be really useful to add to this conversation? Um, where do we go? I think, I think the thing for me is... I was working with a self-made millionaire in, um, in the UK, really funny guy. And he said to me, he said, Daniel, how can a guy with no brain make more money than a brain surgeon? 
<laughs> and so I, I got to know this guy really, really well. I worked with him for more than a year and a half. And when he grew up, uh, his mother and father were alcoholics. And he lived in council houses and he'd move from house to house and um, he would sleep on feces and urinated mattresses. Um, and when there was no mattress, it was on the floor. And he knew that he had to get out of this council estate because his family members started dying of drug overdoses and people were joining the gangs. And so he didn't know what to do. All he knew he was he had to get out of where he was at. And that was enough of a motivator for him. So he took his first job and he worked in the bacon factory, slaughtering pigs. And his job was to jam the cotton cloth down the pig's uh, ass so the shit didn't fly out when it was slaughtered. That was his job. But it got him far enough away from the council estate. And then when he was old enough, he joined the military. And he went over to Afghanistan and he served in the British Armed Forces. So when you begin, you don't have to know what you want at the start. Sometimes just knowing what you don't want is a good place to start. So if you get fed up and you get angry and say, I don't want to be here, yeah. that's a good place to start. Yeah. And then what you got to do, you got to do uh, three things and you can't just do one of these. You've got to do all three. The first is you've got to acquire new knowledge. And according to the Carnegie studies, 7.5% uh, of your success in life will be attributed to your level of knowledge. Now, your knowledge becomes redundant every two and a half to three years. So if you went to school, university, you read a book 10 years ago, it won't even apply to real life today. So you've got to keep acquiring knowledge. Once you acquire knowledge, you then have to acquire the skill that allows you to implement that knowledge. But unfortunately, skill alone only attributes to seven and a half percent of your success. So knowledge and skill combined is only 15% of your success. You can't go without it. You've got to have it. But fully 85% of your success in life will come from your mental attitude. And in aviation, we call this your angle of attack. It's how you approach things. So if you're approaching something with an attitude of insecurity, you're destined to fail. So 85% of your success in life is going to come from creating a positive mental attitude. And you can't have a positive mental attitude with insecurity. So you have to work with a coach. And you have to remove those insecurities so that you can approach your goals with confidence. And they're the three things that have to be done. And this guy who says he's got no brain and earns more than a brain surgeon has done those three things. Today, he's a self-made millionaire. Uh, he's 38. Uh, he lives in a mansion and he drives a beautiful Range Rover has a lovely daughter uh, has about 15,000 people who works next to him and he has exactly what he wants. But it doesn't matter where you're starting from. All that matters is where you're going. Incredible. What a great place to leave. Uh, you mentioned as we were starting this show that you, you had really prepared for this conversation. And I, I want to thank you sincerely for that preparation because uh, you've given us a gift. Like you've given us a gift out of the essence of who you are. And you embody the message just like your parents embodied their message to you. You have shown up and embodied something very powerful, and um, I find that I find that a beautiful gift. So thank you from my heart, and I'm sure that our listeners will thank you too. So great place to leave it. Uh, where can people find you if they've um, been impacted by what you've shared and want to find out more about you? Where do you hang out online? What, what would you suggest? Two places I hang out. Uh, one is my website. Very simple. Uh, DanielTolson.com, and that talks about my personal story and the things that uh, my wife and I are up to in business. And the second place you can always find me on Facebook. So uh, Daniel Tolson on Facebook, you'll find me there. You'll see a photo of me, my wife, and uh, my kids. That's where we are. Wonderful. We'll leave it there. Thanks again for your time and your energy. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Anytime. Let's do it again. Let's.